Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Facebook Live class for woodland owners on our Learn About Your Land Facebook page. My name is Bill Clace. I'm a natural resources educator with UW-Madison Division of Extension. And tonight, we will be talking about Snapshot Wisconsin. So you can pose questions to us during the broadcast by entering them as a comment in the Facebook Live post or send them to me via email to our email account, learnaboutyourland, all one word, at gmail.com. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Christine, and uh, you can introduce yourself and talk about Snapshot Wisconsin. Uh, thanks, Bill, very much. I'm happy to be here today to talk with you about a project that I coordinate at the Wisconsin DNR. Um, as Bill said, my name is Christine Anhalt Deppies. I'm a research scientist with the Wisconsin DNR, where I coordinate the Snapshot Wisconsin project. Um, for those of you who haven't heard about Snapshot Wisconsin before, it is a statewide citizen science project for monitoring wildlife. So I'm going to share a bit about the project, um, how you can get involved starting today from your home computer, um, and then I'm happy to answer questions that folks might have about the program or about using trail cameras to monitor wildlife. So I'm going to bring up my presentation here. It has some slides that I'll share. Are we good to go on the screen sharing there, Bill? Yes. Wonderful. OK. Um, so as I mentioned, Snapshot Wisconsin is a Wisconsin DNR project that's a partnership to monitor wildlife year round using a statewide network of trail cameras. The goals of the program are twofold. They're to increase public engagement in natural resources through hands on learning. Um, and also to provide data needed uh, to make wildlife management decisions by um, the Wisconsin DNR. The project um, launched back in 2015, so we've been going for quite a few um, years now. And there's a couple of different ways that the public can get involved in the program. And I should mention that all the photos that you're seeing here today in the slide presentation are from uh, Snapshot Wisconsin trail cameras. So a little preview of what our volunteers are seeing um, and what you might see if you get involved in the program. So the first way that uh, folks can get involved in Snapshot Wisconsin is to sign up to host a trail camera. Um, the requirements for hosting a trail camera are that you have access to 10 acres or more of land, um, that you also have a computer with internet access, and the ability to go out and check uh, a camera once every three months. Um, so you can sign up to host a camera on your own property, um, but you could also partner with a friend or even um, place a camera on public land. So uh, you can sign up through our website um, for a particular area that you're interested in. Um, the idea here is that we would provide you all the equipment that you need to participate, and then you would be responsible for going out and checking that trail camera and maintaining it throughout the year. And we actually have quite a few folks who are already engaged in hosting a trail camera. Um, this map that you can see here is a couple months old. Uh, but hasn't changed uh, quite a bit in the last couple of months. Um, so each of the orange dots that you're seeing are different survey uh, blocks where volunteers have signed up um, and are hosting a trail camera currently. We also have a couple of areas that are dedicated to monitoring the elk population. Um, so those are the represented by the blue squares on this map. We have right now about um, 1,800 volunteers hosting over 2,100 trail cameras. And since the start of the program in 2015, uh, they've collected an impressive 42 million photos. Uh, so it's hard to believe how much the program has grown in that time. And we're now in all um, 72 counties of Wisconsin. And of course, um, it's not just about collecting those photos, but the important part here is to know what's in the photos so that the data can be used for wildlife um, monitoring and management and support management decisions. And so um, our, many of our trail camera hosts are also helped to identify what's in the wildlife in our trail camera photos or the wildlife that's in our trail camera photos. Um, but in many uh, cases, we have photos that still need identifications or for photos that are particularly difficult to identify that look more like a blur across your screen, 
we have an online crowdsourcing website where people from around the world um, can actually log in to help identify wildlife that are in the photos. Um, and this is at snapshotwisconsin.org. So uh, anyone here today even can log on to this website um, and help to identify wildlife from across the state. It's a pretty intuitive, easy to use interface. You've got the photo that shows up on the left and a list of species, as you can see, that shows up here on the right. And we're asking you to identify them as well as how many individuals are in the photo. And I can't do a snapshot Wisconsin presentation without showing a preview of some of the photos. So uh, this is just a bit of a sneak peek of what some of our volunteers are seeing who are either hosting trail cameras or uh, classifying photos on our crowdsourcing website. We've got some really amazing pictures of individual animals such as elk. Um, some of our favorite photos are those that capture different species together. Um, a common scene is turkeys captured with deer in the photos. We also get some really amazing photos of young um, with adults. And so now is really the perfect time of year to, to get a trail camera out on the landscape to see some of these scenes. We've got a sandhill crane there with a single poult, a bobcat with a kitten, a group of otters, coyote, a porcupine, um, and even some really great snapshots of uh, different types of birds for those who uh, might be birders in the group who are watching now or watching later. Uh, most of the wildlife that we're capturing on the trail cameras are these um, small to large mammals. Our protocol is set up to be able to capture a whole variety of wildlife um, but occasionally we also get um, some great images of, of birds as well who uh, just happen to fly right in front of the camera to trigger it. Deer are always very curious about the trail cameras, so we get a lot of up close and personal shots of white tailed deer. Grouse. Um, of course, those are some of our very best shots that I just showed you, but a lot more of our photos do end up looking like this, a quick blur. Uh, if there's any uh, guesses out there, I'll give you a moment to think about what this might be. Um, actually, uh, this is actually a white-tailed deer, um, even though it's a bit hard to tell. You can see the white flag there as the deer runs away. And this maybe is a white-tailed deer as well. So we'll end up with some mystery photos as well uh, as some uh, excellent shots as you saw previously. So an important uh, goal of Snapshot Wisconsin, as I said earlier, is to provide data for wildlife management decision support. And so this is more than just a great collection of photos, but photos that are actually being used as data um, to tell us about the wildlife of Wisconsin. Uh, what you're seeing in this figure is a breakdown of the animal photos that we see on Snapshot Wisconsin trail cameras. As you might have guessed, the vast majority of photos, and actually 66% uh, of the photos of the animal photos that we capture are of deer. That's closely followed by squirrels, raccoon, or rather not closely followed, but um, squirrels jump all the way down to 9%, um, and that's closely followed by raccoons and turkeys, and breaks down even further to cottontails, coyotes, elk, and then everything else. And right now we're working to integrate Snapshot Wisconsin into management um, decision support all throughout the year. And there's one particular way that we're using Snapshot Wisconsin right now um, that I wanted to highlight in this presentation. And that's the use of uh, fawn to doe ratios, the use of um, Snapshot Wisconsin to generate fawn to doe ratios. And fawn to doe ratios are 
uh, simply the number of fawns divided by the number of does that we see in the summer months. And this is an important measure of recruitment for the deer population or how many individuals are added to the deer population each year. And this fawn to doe ratio is one of the major components of the model that's used to assess the size of the white-tailed deer population. And so through Snapshot Wisconsin, we're able to help fill some of the gaps in data um, that we previously had. Uh, so we're able to, um, this last year, I believe, provide um, fawn to doe ratios in all of the deer management units from Snapshot Wisconsin. And this data helps to provide some information about fawn to doe ratios on interior uh, forest sites, as well as uh, all throughout the, throughout the day. Um, so we're really excited about this application of Snapshot Wisconsin for wildlife management. And uh, there's certainly more to come on that as the program has grown and, and continues to grow and expand. Just want to quickly acknowledge all the folks who work at, on Snapshot Wisconsin at Wisconsin DNR. We also um, work closely with a number of university partners and collaborators. And the great thing about this project is the people who participate in the project, the thousands of volunteers who participate, who uh, without this project would not be possible. So it's really people-powered research, which to me is the most exciting part about working on Snapshot Wisconsin. And I am going to um, leave this here on the screen for um, a moment. This is uh, where you can find out more about Snapshot Wisconsin is through the DNR website by searching the keyword Snapshot Wisconsin. And this is sort of the home hub for all the information on Snapshot Wisconsin. You can find out information about how to um, sign up to host a trail camera, as well as if you want to help classify photos online from your computer. Now there's a link um, to do that as well. And our email address uh, for the team is at the top there if you have any questions that uh, you think to ask later. But for now, um, I am happy to take questions as they come in um, about Snapshot Wisconsin. Great, and they're coming in, Christine. Uh, first one is, where is the best place to set a trail camera? That's a great question, Bill. So we uh, recommend to our volunteers, our, our focus really for the program is to capture a, a diversity of wildlife. Um, so if that's your goal as well, a great place to start scouting for where you might wanna put your trail camera is near water um, because many animals use waterways um, to travel along. Um, so we suggest that if you have water on your property that you, you start there and then you start looking for game trails that you know are used by a variety of species. And one of the best places to put a trail camera is really um, at the intersection of multiple game trails. And it's not just about um, where you put the camera, but also how you mount it. There's a number of different uh, strategies for mounting uh, trail cameras. And again, depending on what you wanna capture, but for volunteers who participate in our program, we ask that they set the trail camera about 10 to 15 feet back from that trail that they have identified, and also about two and a half to three feet off the ground. And this really, again, allows us to capture that diversity of wildlife. So on our trail cameras, we get everything um, down to the size of squirrels and all the way up to actually moose. Uh, we've captured a few moose on our trail cameras we do only end up usually seeing the legs and the underside of the belly on the moose, um, but enough still that we're able to identify that there that it is a moose in the photo. Um, so those are some, some tips and some recommendations that I would suggest for, for where to start uh, with placing your tra trail camera. Um, one thing that I did just mention or did, did, did just think of now is that um, you also want to think about tra uh, trails that are good for capturing wildlife. Um, year round. So there might be uh, some trails that wildlife only tend to use in the summer and then in the winter they tend to be restricted to a, a more a smaller subset of trails. And so if you're going to have your camera out year round, I would recommend um, thinking about trails that you know are active throughout the year or, or at least just starting to pay attention to trails that you know are active also in the winter months. Great. So you mentioned there's still plenty of places for volunteers to participate. Um, any specific parts of the state that need more volunteers than others? 
Yeah, that's a great question. The best way for people to see what's available uh, right now, uh, the regions that are available for people to participate on are, are by going to our website, um, the dnr.wi.gov, and then typing in keyword snapshot Wisconsin. You'll see a link there to our signup page. And the first thing you're going to see on the signup page is actually a map. And that map shows um, the regions that are currently filled, uh, the areas where we have volunteers already, and the areas where we need volunteers. And there are plenty of places open. As I mentioned, we have about 2,100 trail cameras on the landscape, um, but we actually have the state divided into over 6,000 survey blocks. So there's plenty of open survey blocks where people can help, um, help out hosting a trail camera. Great, okay, here's another one. I seem to get all the same wildlife in my pictures. What can I do to different to attract other wildlife? Um, that's a great question. Um, in the case of uh, Snapshot Wisconsin, we are uh, making sure that we're capturing natural animal movement. And so we don't do any um, baiting or feeding uh, or lures of wildlife uh, or to attract them to the, to the area where uh, the trail cameras are. We, we really want to focus on capturing natural animal movement. So the way that we're trying to get a diversity of wildlife in front of the trail camera is by really spending a lot of time on scouting for a good camera location. And that's what I would recommend um, to folks. And with the Snapshot Wisconsin program, we are set up to do long-term wildlife monitoring. So the goal is to try to um, get a good record of the wildlife that are in one particular area throughout the year. Um, but it does take some trial and error at first, I would say. So if you um, find that you're only getting deer in front of your camera, which is what we commonly hear, um, I would suggest doing some additional scouting, uh, moving your camera to a different location. Um, and it might also be um, kind of Looking closely at where the wildlife are traveling um, is another thing that you can think about. So maybe you initially set up your camera to where you thought it was going to be 10 to 15 feet from the trail, but really you're much closer or much further away. So sort of analyzing um, your setup and your location is one of the best ways that I think that you can um, uh, do if you're interested in attracting a, a more diverse wildlife in front of your trail camera. Okay, here's another question. Why is there a 10 acre requirement? I have a pond and a lot of diversity of animals, but I don't have 10 acres. Another great question. Um, the 10 acre requirement goes back to that idea that we really wanna capture natural animal movement. So it's important to the program that we uh, don't end up with trail cameras in someone's backyard near a house or a building that's really gonna be affected by um, uh, or that's really going to affect wildlife movement. So if you do have uh, access to land that is um, smaller than 10 acres, I would still encourage you to apply, uh, uh, particularly if your land is adjacent to um, na a natural area. We definitely have cases where, you know, a volunteer maybe only has a, a few acres, but they're adjacent to a larger natural area or a larger um, uh, park, park or public land, um, state park or public land, and in those cases, uh, we can definitely work with the, the volunteer to still get them to participate in the program. But for even folks who live on maybe a small um, city lot, there still are uh, opportunities for people to participate uh, through classifying photos online. Um, and, and also uh, this opportunity to participate on public land. So I'm going to encourage folks to think about that as well if they don't necessarily think that they live or have property where they can participate. Um, there's plenty of public land in Wisconsin and we can work with you to get permission from the property manager and get you set up to be monitoring wildlife in those areas as well. Okay. Does the camera need to be operated all year? If this is a two-part question, uh, what happens to it during the non-operation periods? Yeah, so we, for folks who are participating in Snapshot Wisconsin, we are asking them to commit to the program for a whole year. Um, and we ask that they check their camera once every three months. So you're really only going out several times a year to check the camera. Um, and again, that's because we really are interested in being able to monitor wildlife throughout the entire year in that particular location. 
I know this is a little bit different than how most people um, use their trail cameras. They maybe only have their trail cameras in one particular um, uh, out for a particular part of the year, or they might move their trail cameras around to different uh, parts of the property, uh, which is certainly one, um, one strategy. But I think the one thing that's really neat about Snapshot Wisconsin is that you do get to see uh, wildlife and how they use that area and how that changes uh, throughout the entire year. Okay, here's a kind of a general question about trail cameras. Uh, I've had my camera stolen and want to know where to place them so it doesn't happen again. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's sometimes not just about where the camera was um, placed, but also having to do with um, how it was uh, disguised, I guess. Um, so, you know, first of all, in the case of Snapshot Wisconsin, we want to be sure, again, as I said, we're capturing natural animal movement. So we ask people to generally avoid areas where there's a lot of human traffic. You know, we don't want to put a trail camera on a hiking trail, uh, for example. And so that helps to avoid um, cases of theft where someone might come happen along um, the camera. Uh, there's also a number of different security solutions uh, around uh, available for trail cameras that you can buy um, commercially, including um, these metal boxes that go over trail cameras with padlocks and security locks. Um, but you know, of course, those those can be cut, and that does happen. Um, so in addition to keeping it out of areas that um, where you, you have high human traffic, um, it's also a, a matter of, um, I think you can, what I've heard some people do is they'll use um, branches or sticks to place them around the camera so that it better bend, blends in with the landscape. So that's another strategy um, to try to disguise your camera a bit more um, if you think it's gonna be happened upon. And in the case of Snapshot Wisconsin, I did wanna mention that um, if, you, if your camera does get stolen, um, which we have had happen before, unfortunately, you're not held liable or anything like that, mm. we'll get you um, up and running to get another trail camera um, and get you, um, get your camera, get another camera back out on the landscape. So, uh, and, and we do provide some of those security uh, pieces as well for folks who might be participating on public land. We also have a number of educators who participate in the program um, who might be uh, who might have a camera on a school forest um, that also gets a lot of traffic. So um, that's something that we can work with you on. Kind of related to the placement of the camera, what about people have problems with brush and low branches in front of the camera? They get that takes a lot of pictures of that. Is there some guidelines as to, this is a question that came in about how much of that should be cleared away so that the camera has a clear field of vision? Sure. Yeah, this is a common problem that people have with trail cameras, particularly if you, a lot of trail cameras, you can change the settings to be highly sensitive or not so sensitive. And if you have a camera that's set up to be quite sensitive, meaning that it's easily triggered, uh, sometimes waving vegetation, it can set off the camera and cause what we call a false trigger. Um, and uh, there's a couple of different ways to avoid this. If you have a camera, um, where you can change the sensitivity, you can try to adjust the sensitivity down. Um, in the case of, um, you know, a snapshot Wisconsin camera or another camera where you can't adjust the sensitivity, you can think about, again, about camera placement. So something that we recommend to folks is um, try to think ahead uh, to the growing season and what the area is going to look like. Um, during the peak of the growing season. So if you go out there in spring, it might look like a great spot, but then you get all these tall grasses that grow up during the summer months. So it does help if you're familiar with the area or you go out with someone who's familiar with the area to be able to identify um, an area that's gonna be good year round. And then of course you can also trim back some vegetation um, in the case of your own property. Um, if you're working on a property that's not yours, of course, you do want to get permission to do that. Um, but you can think about trimming back vegetation in the general angle of the camera view, um, which I think in most cases for most cameras is about 45 degrees or less than that. 
Um, so thinking in kind of this wedge triangle shape out from the camera and trimming back large vegetation that you think could um, cause the camera to take a picture. I got some more technical questions about the camera mounting. Um, how are the trail cameras mounted? Is it on a tree or some other mounting approaches used? Sure. In the case of um, Snapshot Wisconsin, uh, the uh, vast majority of our cameras are mounted on a tree and there's a couple of different options. We provide um, screw-in mounts, so mounts that actually screw into the tree and then you screw your camera on top of that. That allows you to be um, to adjust the angle a little bit more. Um, other options and what's commonly provided with an off-the-shelf camera is just a um, a nylon sort of strap that straps up around the tree and goes through some pieces on the back of the camera. One thing that's a little bit tricky about the straps is that um, it takes a little bit of uh, finagling to get it to adjust to the correct angle. Um, you know, in the case where you have a tree that's not perfectly straight, if your tree is leaning this way or is leaning this way, you've got to, you know, wedge some branches in between the tree and the camera to get it, you know, pointed at the right angle. So um, we do recommend that people use the screw-in tree mounts if that's something that they're comfortable with. You know, in some cases, um, if people are doing um, harvest of trees on their property, that might not be something that they want to do. So there is that option to use a strap, uh, a mount that straps on. And then in the cases where uh, folks are concerned about security, we have these um, secure metal boxes that I had mentioned, and then a, a cable lock that threads through those. So it's a similar setup to the um, nylon strap where it maybe is a little bit more difficult to set it up, but it does offer some um, added security. And all of those types of uh, mounting units are available on the market in the same places where you would go and get your trail camera. So those are the types of things that you could um, be on the lookout if you're interested in purchasing a, a trail camera just for wildlife monitoring on your property. So um, you talked a little bit about management decisions being made from the pictures for deer and a question about what about other wildlife? Is it other pictures being used for making decisions about managing for other wildlife beyond deer? Yeah, um, a couple of different species in addition to deer where information um, from snapshot is being used uh, for wildlife um, decision support. Um, that would be in the case of elk. Uh, so as you saw on one of the maps that I showed earlier in the presentation, we have those specific regions where we have a concentrated grid of trail cameras that are set aside for monitoring the reintroduced elk populations of Wisconsin. And, and so we're able to, from those trail cameras, um, help to provide information for population estimates, as well as um, a similar uh, calf to cow ratio, similar to the fawn to doe ratio that I mentioned for deer. We're also providing information about wolf locations to direct tracking efforts. Um, in addition, we're working um, to make sure that we provide any rare species uh, detections back to our partners in wildlife management. So as I mentioned, we've gotten a couple of um, wolf, or excuse me, um, moose uh, on trail cameras, um, as well as uh, marten, a whooping crane. And then most recently, we had our first um, two cougars captured on a snapshot Wisconsin camera. Cool. So that information is on the DNR website. Um, so we've gotten a few of these rare species sightings that we've been able to contribute, which I really think speaks to the power of having this large um, statewide network that we're, uh, that we started to capture some of these rare species as well. And there's plenty of other applications for um, Snapshot Wisconsin that we're working on right now um, with regards to turkeys, some of our other fur bear species, as well as bear. And so there's definitely um, more to come with that. We're just at the, the very beginning of um, being able to use Snapshot to um, support management decisions in the agency. Very cool. Well, that's all the questions we have, Christine. Thanks for your time this evening. And uh, we had some good questions that came in. Um, I want to finish up by saying that uh, we're hosting some webinars on, on Mondays and Tuesdays in June. And you can get details about those that are coming up on our website, woodlandinfo.org. So thanks again, Christine, and everybody have a good evening.
Happy to be here. Thank you.